for now. Greetings and good afternoon. afternoon. On, on behalf of the board, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 10th meeting of the ETSU Board of Trustees. It's great to be meeting again here in the Millennium Center with the fall semester underway on campus. We have three new trustees that have joined us today. One appointed by Governor Lee, one representing the ETSU faculty, and one representing ETSU students. We will take official action and vote on them shortly. <clears throat> I'd like to take a minute to briefly introduce them. First, Mr. Kelly Wolf was appointed to the board this past summer by Governor Lee. Mr. Wolf is a highly respected businessman and developer in East Tennessee. He founded his company, Wolf Development, in 1994. He also served for nearly 10 years as mayor of Jonesboro. In addition to the ETSU Board of, Direct of Trustees, he was also appointed by Governor Lee to serve on the Tennessee Historical Commission. Second, Dr. Virginia Foley is a professor in educational leadership and policy analysis. She came to East Tennessee State University after retiring from public education in Georgia. She earned her doctorate in educational administration from the University of Alabama. She is the program coordinator for the administrative endorsement program and served as faculty senate president during the 2014-16 academic years. Third, Christopher Santana, our student trustee, is originally from Ecuador and has already completed two degrees at ETSU. In May of 2018, Mr. Santana earned a BBA in economics and a BBA in finance. Currently is in his second year of pursuing his master's degree in business administration. Trustees Wolf, Foley, and Santana, thank you for your willingness to serve. It has been a busy four weeks with the start of the fall semester. I want to take a moment to thank all of the staff who worked to recruit and enroll our new freshman class. Our enrollment figures look solid with the university remaining in its budget confidence intervals. I also want to thank all of the staff who have worked for many years to move our graduation rate from 41% to 50%, which is the highest in the history of the university. We look forward to hearing specifics from Dr. Nolan, Nolan during his report this afternoon. I would also like to thank staff across the campus, particularly Dr. Dennis DePew, uh, for their leadership and work to host the regional summit that was held at the Millennium Center earlier this month. The forward dialogue on issues, opportunities, and challenges facing the Appalachian Highlands was among the most important conversations that I've been a part of in several years. I encourage the campus to stay engaged with this work and to help lead this work, which is central to our mission to improve the lives of the people in this region. I'd now turn to the next item on our agenda and ask Dr. Green to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Trustee Ayers? Here. Trustee DiCarlo? Here. Trustee Foley? Here. Trustee Golden? Here. Trustee Grisham? Present. Trustee Latimer? Here. Trustee Ramsey? Here. Trustee Santana? Present. Trustee Wolf? You say wolf? Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> and Chairman Nice Walker. Here. Here. We now on the agenda have uh, uh, item number three. Dr. Green, do we have individuals who signed up to speak to the board as part of the public comment portion of our agenda? Yes, sir. We have two individuals. Okay. 
Each speaker will have two minutes. Um, and our first speaker is Connor McClelland. Connor could come to the podium. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to President Nolan, uh, the trustees, and all in attendance today. Uh, my name is Connor McClelland, and I'm a junior here at ETSU. Uh, I'm coming to you as the co-founder of Adjunct Action, but also as a concerned student and community member. Um, Adjunct Action is a campaign started last year by myself, a fellow student, Austin Cable, and a group of passionate students, some of which have joined me here today. Um, we have advocated in conjunction with a number of employee, campus, and community organizations for an increase in adjunct professor compensation. Last year, the average adjunct, adjunct at ETSU was making $400 less per credit hour than not only the national average, but the averages of our peer institutions. We have held numerous events, led an information campaign, and garnered well over 2,000 petition signatures demanding fair pay and treatment for adjunct professors. Um, and as a senator in our Student Government Association, I wrote a resolution co-sponsored by many fellow student leaders regarding the issue um, that passed nearly unanimously. All that work that I just discussed is now in the rear view. And with some moderate pay increases in a few colleges across campus as a result, we are grateful for progress, but remain unwavering in our pursuit of a university where hard work is met with fair pay and treatment. We, we still have not reached our goal of a universal base pay in all colleges of $1,000 per credit hour, as well as a general improvement of employment conditions. This will make us competitive amongst our peer institutions and put us on, on par with the rest of the nation and seems ever more justifiable in light of yet another increase in costs on students. We aren't going anywhere until this is seen through. Our conviction is steadfast. Um, in closing, I simply want to ask that the president and the board continue to address these concerns and take actions to make the demands of this campaign a reality so that we know that the institution that we call our own is doing justice by our incredible, is doing justice by our incredible instructors and the community at large. In doing so, we also hope that you will keep the public informed of progress and that you will prioritize this issue in consideration of your employees and their stability. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dorothy Drinkard Hawkshaw. Ma'am, we'll need you to go to the mic, please. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you so much for allowing me to speak. To tell you the truth, I did not come to speak. Uh, someone asked me to. So there are two major issues that I would like to bring to the attention of the Board of Trustees. One would be Chief Collin, who just resigned. I think everyone is aware of that. And there are many faculty members who are very disappointed about her resignation, and they have talked about it. She is very strict in rules and regulations. And because of that, she of course, was not appreciated by many security people because she has strict rules and regulations that supported the university's safety. And that is the most important thing I'm concerned about safety on this campus. And many other people are too. And you need someone who has strict rules and regulations for workers in that area and they did not like that so she resigned and many faculty are really saddened by that so much so that i really want to cry um, the second issue is related to the program that i direct africana studies i am the founder of that organization when i first came to this institution as chair of the history department. There was not even a course on black American history. That's terrible because this is a great country and it can become a greater country if we know all of our history and what all of our people have contributed to making this a great nation. And that 
uh, program is essential to the future of this country. And that is why the major universities and even some of the universities that are not as major have this program, Africana Studies. And we are not getting the budget that we need or that we once have. And I want to ask the Board of Trustees to support providing more funding for this very important program to help improve not only race relations in this country, but to help improve knowledge in general that will lead to the appreciation of all people who have helped to make the world greater as well as the United States of America. And I would like to give attention to the fact that the Africana Studies program does not even have a professor who is uh, academically qualified to teach a basic course to the department or to the program. It's not a department yet. I hope that it will become a department. Yes, and um, thank you so much. I'm sorry to go beyond my two minutes, but I'm a professor and that's who I am. Sorry. <laughs> Item four on the agenda today is the approval of the April 16th minutes. Do I have a motion for approval? Sorry. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. 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 Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Thank you. Uh, item five, approval of the minutes of June 17th. Do I have a motion? June. So moved. I have a second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those likes on. Okay. Six, approval of student trustee under tab two in your board book. In accordance with the FOCUS Act, this board of trustees is required to appoint a non voting student member to its board. You will find this agenda item under tab two, and I will call on President Mullen to present. Mr. Chair, members of the board, thank you. I had the opportunity in the chair's opening comments to learn a little bit about the background of Mr. Santana. I want to speak just some about the process through which he was selected. Uh, he was nominated through a series of activities associated with students. He was interviewed by SGA staff. He was interviewed by myself, and I can assure you that as you look across the spectrum of individuals who comprise the student body on this campus, he is among our campus's best leaders. Um, this is a process in which the students present nominees, and I can assure you that Mr. Santana, because I've had the chance to work with him, uh, is going to make an outstanding board member. So I enthusiastically endorse the recommendation from the student body and present Mr. Santana for your consideration. Do I have a motion to accept uh, Mr. Sanders? No moves. Position, student trustee. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Next is the report from the Finance Administration Committee, Mr. DeCarlo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bear with my voice, it's bad, I'm leaning in. They told me to lean in. So on behalf of Dr. King, who does an outstanding job, let me read and let me report on the committee meeting this morning. The committee approved an out-of-state tuition strategy for the Quillen College of Medicine. The out-of-state tuition will be set at 30% of the in-state tuition each year. Now what that means is the, the out-of-state student pays 100%, as if you were in state, and then now you'll pay 30% uh, as an out of state resident. You historically have been paying 90%. So there was a, an, an interesting discussion, and, and frankly, um, something that was needed to do in terms of our recruiting. The committee also reviewed quarterly agreements of 250,000 and over. The agreements were all processed in accordance with state policy. 
The committee received a capital budget and facilities update from Jeremy Ross. The committee reviewed information from human resources on profiles and trends in employment at the university. And the committee received an update on the activities of the university foundation, which were enlightening. Um, but with that, I conclude my report. Thank you very much. There are no further action items. Uh, item eight, report on the Academic Research and Student Success Committee, Dr. Linda Latimer. Chairman, um, during the Academic Research and Student Success Committee this morning, we approved the minutes from April 26 with edits requested related to the committee's sponsored research. So we will review those edits when they come out. Um, otherwise, we approve the minutes. Um, we approved a letter of notification on the creation of a Master's of Science degree in prosthetics and orthotics. This actually then led to a committee conversation on how we as a board member and as a board collectively can help ETSU facilitate academic program approval processes quicker. It just seems that it takes a long time for us to be able to move the needle and a lot of that is outside of East Tennessee State University's control. So we were thinking perhaps as a collective board at our next summit with all of the other governing boards, this might be a great platform to see if we can't help our university be able to move faster in order to compete with the private schools that can eat our cookie before we even have a chance. So that was one interesting discussion. Um, the committee also received updates on the university's review process of the chairs of excellence, as well as an update on the su student success initiatives. Then we followed with a critical conversation on research and innovation. And then lastly, the committee approved three action items that the full board must vote on, including the letter of notification that I mentioned earlier. Um, so at this time, with permission of the chair, I would ask Dr. Bishop and Dr. Bird to come forward and really briefly present the items for board consideration, which include tenure, code of conduct, and letter of notification. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, at your April meeting, you approved uh, the regular review process uh, individuals for promotion and tenure. Since that time, we have added uh, three additional faculty to the university who come with uh, essential experience and credentials uh, who have been reviewed through the process for tenure upon appointment. And we bring those three individuals to you today. Dr. Frederick Gordon, who was appointed as director of the Master of Public Administration program, effective August 15. Uh, he is, uh, will, is a member of the Department of Political Science. Dr. Christopher Keller, who was appointed as Dean of the Honors College, is effective August 15. He will be granted tenure in the Department of Literature and Language. And Dr. Brian Parton, P-A-R-T-I-N, uh, was appointed to serve the university school as the director, effective September 30, 2019. We bring these three individuals to the board for approval. Okay. Uh, revision of student code of conduct requires make a vote, I think, on that one. Okay. Just a motion. Just a motion? Mm -hmm. And then second, and then uh, you don't need a roll call on that one. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a motion to accept the three? So okay. moved. Second. 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 Okay. All in favor, please. Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Bird, Dean of Students. Uh, this morning I presented a proposed, some proposed changes to our student code of conduct. To summarize those quickly, uh, it included a, the addition of a medical amnesty policy, which was a resolution provided to me by the Student Government Association. Uh, it also included changes to our sexual misconduct hearing processes as necessitated by a Senate bill that passed recently and some slight changes to our uh, violations, which included the uh, addition of ammunition as a prohibited item on campus, uh, which we felt aligned with uh, weapons violations and rules that we now abide by. Um, I'm able to answer any questions, but those are uh, just a broad summary of some updates and changes to that code. Okay. Do we have a motion? to accept those. So moved. And a second? 
I second. Dr. Green, roll call, please. Trustee Ayers? Yes. Trustee DiCarlo? Yes. Trustee Foley? Yes. Trustee Golden? Yes. Trustee Grisham? Yes. Trustee Latimer? Yes. Trustee Ramsey? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Chairman Nicewanger? Yes. Uh, this next uh, item is uh, part of the fun of working at a university, and that is the development and creation of new programs. Um, the College of Clinical and Rehabilitative Sciences brings forth a letter of notification, and this is the first step in the approval process for creating a new program of study. Uh, and this is for a master's degree in prosthetics and orthotics. Uh, it's the first degree of its kind in the state of Tennessee and the surrounding region. Uh, it is, offers the potential for collaboration with the Veterans Administration uh, and has been very much supported by Congressman Rowe, who has included opportunities for the Dean of our college and others uh, in the planning process to visit Walter Reed Hospital and look at their prosthetics and orthotics program. Uh, it is consistent with the university mission, uh, that, and it is consistent with the state's goal to increasing the workforce and increasing the number of individuals within the state who graduate with uh, advanced degrees. Uh, we believe that this is a program that has, through our study, uh, significant feasibility based on workforce need uh, and on the limited number of programs across the country. Uh, the complete program is in your packet, but I'll be pleased to answer any questions you might have. Okay, do I have a, a motion for acceptance? I'll make that motion. And a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, next is a report from the Audit Committee. All right. David Gold. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I always appreciate your waiting uh, for the best for last. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone likes audit. Um, after approving the minutes this morning, we took up two action items that you'll find on the consent agenda. One is the adoption of the compliance charter. As you know, compliance has always been important and is the next logical step in the university's progression on compliance. They've established a centralized office of compliance, which necessitated the adoption of a charter. There's one small modification from the materials that were already mailed out that when you take up the consent agenda, if you would read the proposal in the light of the change, you'll see in the compliance charter in a certain section, there's a list of other uh, organizations within the institution that the Office of Compliance collaborates with, which would include HR, audit, and legal. And we suggest, <clears throat> excuse me, we suggested that they also add um, athletic compliance in that list, which they did. So when you vote on that, the consent agenda, if you would consider uh, athletic compliance to, uh, for it to be modified to include that. In addition, we reviewed the annual audit plan for fiscal year 2020. After that, we reviewed the audit work performed since our last meeting in April, and then reviewed the recommendation log status, happy to report all greens and blues, which is uh, good. Report of the audit function, we received the 2019 fiscal year report of the audit function and commend Becky and her organization for exceptional work in fiscal year 2019, which included every five years, they have to go through a quality assurance review. And so they did that. That's a pretty laborious uh, exercise to ensure compliance with the Institute of Internal Auditing Standards. And they passed with the, uh, with the highest uh, um, um, assessment. We then reviewed the internal audit employee profile as well as the expenses and then concluded um, into executive session. That's my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next, item 10, cons consent agenda. As noted in your materials found behind tab four of your agenda packet, several items have been reviewed by our board committees this morning. These items include approval of committee minute meetings and university policies. Are there any items on the consent agenda <coughs> members would like to pull for consideration by the full board? Seeing none, then do I have a motion for the adoption of the consent agenda? I move that we accept and adopt the consent agenda. Thank you. Do I have a second? <coughs> second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. 
<clears throat> Item 11, accreditation update. At this point, I'll ask Dr. Sherry Clavier to come forward. Dr. Clavier is the director of Effectiveness, ETSU's accreditation liaison. She will provide a brief presentation on ETSU's fifth year interim report to the Southern Association, Association of Colleges and Schools. Sherry. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. I will um, preface my discussion, full disclosure, by saying that I am a rarity on a college campus in that I get really excited about accreditation. Um, <laughs> And, and so I will try to keep this brief, but <laughs> yes, I, I've seen firsthand how much the quality of an organization can improve through this kind of peer review activity. So I'm excited to share some results with you all today. Um, I'm going to talk first about our accreditation with SAC COC. Um, ETSU this year completed our fifth year interim report. Uh, you may be aware of the comprehensive review that takes place at universities and colleges every 10 years. Um, ETSU underwent that process in 2013 and we'll do it again in 2023. However, the USDOE requires more frequent monitoring and so that's how the fifth year interim report came about. Um, if you look at the materials on the SAC COC website about the fifth year report, it shows that it has five parts, but it actually has six, so I'll talk about that today. Um, three of these are very simple. Um, the first one is just signatures to attest to the fact that the report we submit um, has our full integrity behind it. We're not hiding anything. We're fully disclosing the state of our institution and our responses. The institutional summary form describes what ETSU is, what kinds of programs we offer. Um, so that's always included in these submissions. Only select institutions are required to do a follow-up report. We were not, so we didn't um, have anything to do with that this time through. So I'll talk about the three remaining sections one by one of our fifth year report. Starting with the fifth year compliance certification. So the Commission on Colleges has I counted last night and every time I count, I get a different number because there are lots of ABCs in part one and part two, but around 73 different accreditation standards to which we have to comply and respond to. The fifth year report doesn't look at all of those. It looks at only those that are shown on this slide. Um, so it's about a third of the total amount of accreditation standards. You'll notice some of the numbers here are in bold. Um, that's because those are what SAC COC calls core requirements. And that just means that those are foundational and non-compliance in that area results in an automatic sanction. So those are the, the scary ones for people who are in jobs like me. So the process, we submit a, or we pull together a document which included folks from all across campus. Um, I mean, everything from faculty to public safety to um, off-campus sites, uh, where we document our compliance with each of the standards in the previous slide. That is submitted to a team of people, um, the committee of fifth year reports who conducts the review. This is purely a paper exercise. We mail a report to Atlanta and they lock these folks in a hotel somewhere and they review not only our institution, but a cluster of about 10 institutions that are very similar in size and scope and purpose. Um, that committee has two options after conducting the review, either no referral, which um, in some ways is kind of like a unicorn. It's magical when that happens, but it's also very rare. Um, we've been in that circumstance before with the governance change. You celebrate those wins when you can get them because they don't happen very often. The second outcome is referral to a separate committee, CNR, uh, Compliance and Reports. That committee then undertakes a separate review of the information that was submitted. So I'm happy to report that our results um, in a lot of areas where historically institutions have difficulty showing compliance, we had no recommendations or no requests for additional information. Um, those are shown here. So we got a clean report for each of these areas from that first stage of review. Um, I think this is significant because the commission publishes data on the percentage of institutions that um, get a non-compliance in any of these areas at an off-site review. And so just for example, 
core requirement 6.1 on four-time faculty, 43% of institutions in the most recent round of review were found to be non-compliant at the first stage. We were not. Um, 8.2a, which is very near and dear to my heart because of the second part of my um, role here at ETSU, 49% of institutions are deemed non-compliant. We got no recommendations, no requests for additional information, and so I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, we did have some comments regarding core requirement 8.1 on student achievement. The accreditation standards were updated in 2018, and this was really the first kind of rollout for some pieces of that process. Um, and in some ways, it felt almost like a warning letter, but not an official warning letter to say, well, you did a good job with these pieces, but next time, make sure you address these particular things. And so we will absolutely respond accordingly, um, but they didn't require a particular follow-up. We do have two referral reports that will be due in April 2020 on standards 5.4 and 10.7. Standard 5.4 requires us to employ um, academic and administrative officers with the appropriate experience and qualifications to lead the institution and to evaluate those individuals regularly. Um, the committee that reviewed our documentation said we do have a policy. We um, can show that our policy aligns with uh, the CVs of the individuals in these positions, but what we neglected to include was sufficient evidence to show that we implement the policy that we have in place. Um, we submitted this report in March. I went to the SAC COC Summer Institute in June and learned that anytime you provide a policy, you need to couple that with evidence of the policy being implemented. I wish that the order of that was reversed and we may not have gotten a referral in this case, um, but I do think that this will be a, a simple fix. We have already pulled together redacted evaluations of some of our academic and administrative officers that will submit um, in response to that. Standard 10.7, it's a very similar situation, although a different topic. This one is on policies for awarding credit, so we have to publish and implement policies that show how we determine both the amount and level of credit we offer for our courses and programs, and those have to be overseen by persons who are academically qualified. So in this case, we provided the policies, we showed information about our oversight bodies, which are faculty driven, and we provided blank forms. Again, we just didn't show the evidence that we were using those forms when making decisions. So we will supply that in the report that goes out in April. The second part of the report I'll talk about today uh, relates to the Quality Enhancement Plan. The QEP is an initiative under which an institution spends five years increasing student learning or improving the environment for student learning. Our most recent QEP was called Intop Form, and we just uh, had to write about that experience over the five years of implementing it. So the process uh, is a paper document, again, um, that addresses particular items at the Commission's request. A separate committee of individuals, again, off-site, in Atlanta reviews this document and they have two options, either accept with comment or refer to the CNR committee for review. Our QE impact report was accepted with only positive comments that affirmed that we did what they expected us to do. So I think that was very successful. The last part of the fifth year report that doesn't officially appear when you look at the requirements for the fifth year report is a review of approved off-campus instructional sites that we have initiated since our last reaffirmation. So for ETSU, these are sites where we offer 50% or more of programming that we have started since 2013 when the review team came here. Um, we had three sites. Southwest Virginia Higher Education Center in Abingdon, where we offer the Bachelor's and Master's of Social Work, Lenore Ryan in Asheville, where we offer the Master's in Social Work, and the Kingsport Center for Higher Ed, where we offer the BSN and the Master of Social Work programs. This review works a little bit differently. It starts off the same, so we submit documentation showing our compliance for select standards as it relates to these off-campus instructional sites and programs, and many of those are the same standards we talked about in the compliance certification, but we also pulled in additional information on 
learning and library resources, and on physical facilities. So when I say I work with everyone across this institution, the facilities folks, even, even they're not safe from the accreditation lady. Um, so the process in this one is a little bit different. I prefer this strongly because we submit a document that that team reviews, but then those people come to our campus, they meet with our faculty, they see our facilities, they talk with our students, and get a real sense of exactly what it is that we're doing. So um, we had a team of four individuals that I drove all over the Southeast United States to these sites over a couple of days. Um, they produce a report that then is submitted automatically to the CNR committee. There's a legal disclaimer at the bottom of this page that these results are not official until they're released by the Board of Trustees, which will happen in December, but I'm thrilled to report that we had no recommendations related to any of those programs or any of those sites, and a lot of really positive comments about the work that we're doing throughout the document that the committee provided. Again, it's not official, but um, I will be at the meeting in December where they announce the findings. So we weren't required to respond or do any sort of follow-up. So that's it for our regional accreditation. Another um, update just to provide to you, our office um, isn't as directly involved as people in the different academic disciplines and programs, but we do house information about all of the other accredited programs at ETSU. We have around 60 different programs that are accredited through professional or discipline specific accrediting bodies. And we publish this information on our website and there's a link and where you can find it. We update it at least once a year because we submit it to THEC as a part of our quality assurance funding report. I have just pulled from that very long list some of the activities that have taken place either within the past year or that are coming up within the next year looking forward. Um, we didn't have any types of negative results from any of these. Um, we've got a lot of reports that came in from the accrediting bodies um, with you know, information or suggestions, um, as well as some times coming up where other um, programs will be undergoing accreditation activities within that discipline. So these are just some examples of the activities that will be taking place over about a two-year span. This list is not comprehensive of all the accreditation activities that happen. These are just the ones within the last year and looking forward into the next year. We also have a number of programs um, at ETSU that are seeking accreditation. And so I've listed those for you here and included the body with which they're seeking that recognition. And that concludes my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions from the board? If I could, as a comment. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Clavier for her work. I want to thank the individuals in the room for their work, and I want to put this in context. Uh, sometimes in board meetings, folks want to put their best foot forward and demonstrate the things that are happening across campus from a positive nature. This is one where we are required to present to you the outcome of our regional accrediting actions as well as our programmatic actions. It's rare that an institution undergoes a SAC's fifth year mid-cycle with no findings or recommendations, but that's what we have presented to you today. But I think it's also rare to note that you had 22 programs that have undergone accreditation reviews in the past two years, 22. And as Dr. Clavier just noted, there were no findings or recommendations there either. So sometimes we can get lost in the minutia of activity. You just wanna pull up a little bit, the entire university, fifth year mid-cycle, and for those of you who serve on private boards, you know how complicated this can be and you understand the implications when it doesn't go well, no findings, no recommendations, 22 academic programs, no findings or recommendations. That's a lot of hard work and Dr. Clavier does an excellent job. Yes. Thank you. Next on the agenda are capital projects and facilities update. I'd ask Jeremy Ross, our chief operating officer, make that presentation. So this is one of those, I think, positive, it shows some uh, opportunities going forward. Thanks for that segue, Dr. Nolan. In the years past, we've had a lot more um, data, numbers, things of that sort in this presentation. This one's going to be more philosophical in nature. 
uh, in more of an approach. The reason being, this is the year we're undergoing master planning work. So this is the year where ideas, dreams, and uh, concepts will guide us for the next 10 years. So it's important that we have this type of conversation. This is the master plan we created 10 years ago. Uh, I'll start with a simple comment by saying a lot of people are involved in this, in this type of vision dreaming, particularly as it relates to facilities. Uh, there are people in this room on uh, our staff. I mean, there's uh, Dr. Joe Sherlin's undergoing a huge uh, transformation. B.J. King has been involved. Uh, a lot of facility staff, others. Dr. Nolan certainly leads a lot of this vision. So I will start with a lot of people are involved, and I'm fortunate to get to present this, but I want to say thanks to everyone. I want to start with an approach. This is an architect that I've studied much of my life, and many of us are familiar with him. It's an Italian architect. Two concepts I'd like to push forward is what we followed. One is uh, a philosophy of arcology, which is architecture and ecology coming together, which is the built environment and the natural environment. They work together. This is a, a concept we uh, are taking forward. The other is um, his solutions for implosion rather than an explosion. So 20 years ago, if we wanted a new residence hall, but we had blighted ones, we built a new one. If we had an academic space that wasn't functioning well, well, we leave it, and then we build new. We're trying to address new, but our existing space as well. So these two concepts of implosion and arcology are what we followed. I'd like to take you back a little bit. This was a different architectural philosophy. This is the cult center. Um, this actually came from the 1950s. Um, it's modern architecture. And this particular style, the particular style of a, a modern architecture called brutalist architecture. And it's very rigid, it's a lot of concrete, it's this monolithic. Um, we have not adopted that philosophy. Um, the unique philosophy, form follows function, was part of it. Um, however, I'd like to say, with this thought of arcology, look what it is today. And so this is under construction, but there's a lot of glass, a lot of nature is coming into the building. There are curved shapes, and to, it's actually, um, it's transformative. This, there's been a great team that's worked on this, but to take something so, that is closer to a prison, and to address that issue and fix it uh, in a way like this is, is truly deliberate, um, and it, uh, it, it's been an amazing project. So let's take a look at this. This is part of uh, our renderings and visions that we've had here for several years with this project. You can see as you enter this from the west side, you see wood ceilings. But again, you see the greenery, you see the exterior, you see nature and architecture coming together. Well, is that just a rendering? Well, there it is today. So you see it it's starting to come together. You see the exterior interior. This is the east side. Again, you see wood structures. You see where the bookstore will be, Starbucks. You see these patterns, the exterior. That's what it looked like two days ago. This phase is finished. It's on the top floor. Um, it was an amazing, um, we talked this morning, I, I heard students just, wow, I can't believe this. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, gelato bars, pizza bars, uh, fried chicken Friday. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing place that students are like, it's not finished yet as far as furnishings and things of that sort, but we're getting a glimpse of this building. One quote, Paolo Soleri's mentor is Frank Lloyd Wright, and he said, the longer I live, the more beautiful life becomes. If you feel you should ignore beauty, you will soon find yourself without it. Your life will be impoverished. But if you invest in beauty, it will remain with you all the days of your life. We have almost $300 million in projects um, that are taking place, either in planning, construction, or otherwise. And so the question is, are we investing in beauty? We're sitting in this room. Is it beautiful? Well, they're beautiful people, I suppose. But this will be the room you sit in next year. And this is the East Tennessee room. And as you sit there, I want you to think about that investment into beauty uh, that this board is making and this vision in a lot of people. Because when you look at that, you are forced to stare at some screen and some presentations like you've heard today, but you're, you have to look at the ecology. You have to look at the environment. And there it is. That's what it looked like two or three days ago. And ultimately, what did we do? We framed a Greek theater. It's an amazing, amazing thing to have that on a campus and then to frame it, not just for the board meetings, but hopefully ETSU 101 classes will be in here, other visions. Imagine your first class at East Tennessee State University and you stare at a Greek theater, you see activities. I'd like to think Shakespeare is going on, but it could be anything. It could be the, the, the uh, you know, food wagons out there, other pieces, and you start to learn about this campus. The Martin Center. It's under construction now. This was the vision that we've been working towards in this $53 million building. But again, if you look at the ecology, 
and you look at architecture coming together. It's a little more challenging here. It's a four lane road, the mini dome across the street, but we can be deliberate in that area in this courtyard and bring greenery in. This is the main auditorium. You see a lot of wood finishes. Uh, you see some, uh, even the clouds there to help with acoustics and things, but it's starting to come together. This is what it looked like three days ago. This is the lobby. This is one of my favorite parts. I, I uh, Again, you have this large curtain wall. You can see the upper balconies there on the right side. Uh, but I love these chandeliers. They actually change colors. So if you have no interest in the arts, you can drive by the state of Franklin and you can see blue and gold. You can see them flashing. Uh, I've teased Dr. Nolan at the Celtics win the NBA championship. It'll be green for 20 minutes, maybe, I, I think. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> is that because we won't win a championship or it's just policy? <laughs> okay. Uh, there it is. That's what it looked like yesterday. And so it's starting to come together. This is the recital hall on the side, and I could not get in there to give you the most update to date picture. Lamb Hall, this is an exciting project as well. What I will tell you is not really ready to have a conversation there. This is uh, a fantastic program. It's in the early stages of programming and uh, how we balance renovation with addition. That's what's taking place at the state level here at ETSU as well. Boulevard Commons, I'd like to point out here, if you look at this map, if you, if you go to the far right side, you can see the residence halls, but you see a green space. If you go to the middle of campus, this is a green space. Uh, this is one of the first projects Dr. Nolan uh, pushed for when he first came to campus. You see some deliberate movements as it relates again to this environment coming into buildings and courtyards. But you see a tremendous amount of suburbia. You see a lot of parking spaces, the typical, I'm gonna drive to campus, get out of my car, go to a 45 minute class and go home. Maybe drive through McDonald's and get a milkshake. It's this suburban way. And we're moving away from it. We're making progress, but I would like to highlight the part in the middle, uh, which is which is right here, this part right here. So this is a boulevard. We have a million dollar donation. We have some other projects, water replacement lines, and we think we can do some unique things there. And so if we zoom into that area, this is what it looks like. Roads, a little bit of parking, but a lot of pavement. Um, here's a three-dimensional picture of it. It's, it's just fantastic. Isn't that beautiful? Um, it could be a lot better. Um, so what do other campuses do? Well, this is what one of the greatest American architects, Thomas Jefferson, did. Um, this is the lawn. It's one of the most inspiring spaces in all of America. We could have spaces like that or that or that. And again, you see glass curtain walls, buildings, greenery, cafes coming together. So this is very preliminary. We're just starting a design charrette. Uh, if you look through there, we have two roads. This one's showing two pedestrian streets now. We will probably have one. Uh, it's going to be a deliberate uh, concept to, to come out of the street at the Culp Center to the football arch, the Bank of Tennessee arch at the end, um, that it will we'll have a basically an Arc de Triomphe on one side, and we'll have a point of interest on the other, and this boulevard uh, as we go through. Here's some of the inspirational pieces on the lower right. That's SMU. Uh, this is a, a football game day. You see squares. You see chess, outdoor gaming. You see super seating. So we have hills from our housing. Uh, these are some of the things we can accomplish. We see fire pits, outdoor fitness classes, marketplaces. That odd shape at the top is actually a marketplace. Hammock gardens, sculpture gardens. This is going to be part of the student experience. Millennium Center, I won't belabor it. You're in this space if you want to see one of the labs which is our new cyber program. Dr. Tony Pedarisi is heading this up. This is absolutely going to uh, grow our enrollment. Uh, it will uh, create relevant degrees for our students, and it is in this space, uh, in this building we're in today. Humanities Building, uh, this has been submitted. This has been received well at the state. It's a $72 million project. Again, there is an opportunity here off of the quad, the green space, off of Pride Walk to bring, again, outdoor, indoor space in together. Uh, it's a very exciting uh, space and one that our freshmen, Gen Ed, others can come together with faculty in a, in a first class space. Th this is not the way this will look. It's a block diagram, but you do see the concepts of glass, greenery, those pieces. Housing, we have a housing master plan. We're not ready to present that yet. Um, a lot of this has, has gone through, certainly uh, Dr. B.J. King, Dr. Joe Sherlin are here. Uh, but we're looking at somewhere between uh, $50 million in that range over the next 10 years uh, to address housing issues. But I would like to talk about the exterior. So what should we put outside of housing? Well, we asked students. We did a survey, and this is what they said. Their number one, imagine that swing sets. Would have never guessed it. They want swing sets. Um, 
I don't know. I, I guess I believe them. 69% said they want that. They want outdoor gaming. I, I, I said it would never, ever work. No one will play chess outside. I fought Dr. Nolan for three years, and then I think he did a coup on me and went to the students, and now it's come up this way. But they want that. They want hammock gardens, these pieces. Here's some of the, you can see some, again, fire pits out in the housing, cornhole. Uh, the Umbra, I, I will tell you, they love those areas. Just picnic tables that where they can charge their, their phones. They can, they can pull their laptops in, plug them in. They're wired. And there's, there's Dr. Nolan. I guess he must be one heck of a checker player. Other projects. Um, here again, here's a blighted classroom on the left. Here's what we've done with it. We're starting to address these pieces. This furniture moves. Faculty can come in and have a variety of uh, labs, of uh, space. Technology has been updated. Dr. Karen King's here. She's been a partner in these classroom innovations. There's another one. This is Brown Hall. This is a beautiful space. This is this is something we call low-hanging fruit. We were here, Dr. Nolan and I went on tour with the students. We're looking at Brown Hall, and this was a space that, that arose out of that. And out of that conversation, we put um, a food truck here. We pressure washed the space. We put in um, uh, seating. And if you look at this space here, this is a, an architect I really value a lot, Zaha Hadid. And she says, the architecture is really well-being. I think people just want to feel good in a space. And here we are. With a, with, there's so many credit hours taught in this building. And they can come out, get a bakery item. They can sit in this space. If you're in that space, you don't know if you're at Harvard, the University of Virginia, or East Tennessee State University. It's the quintessential campus space. And it took some, some very small moves. And we'll, we're going to address some more there. This was actually prior to the semester. It's getting a lot of activity. This is one. Uh, the mini dome is a space most people would say is not worthy of an architectural award but it's a space we're starting to embrace so this was a five hundred fifty thousand dollar innovation um that impacts a lot of people um so we have band with about 300 people they can now practice here they pay for a two-hour credit course uh, this is revenue to the university this is music um it's college of education through the sports science programs they use this as well and certainly football does too but this is to embrace this as one of the finest indoor practice facilities for band, for the College of Education, for athletics. Um, it's an asset. This is our baseball stadium. You can see in the far distance, I think it's a very nice structure, very nice space. The entrance is, is hideous. I mean, it's a gravel lot. I always said that's like the Duke boys. You know, you go back in time and it's you're, you're on some back country road. I love the trash can in the front. It has just bothered me. It, and over to the right, that, that's where we laid the steel down, and it was a storage yard for all this construction. That's a great image um, for, for the region to, to see that. And so what could it be? Well, we had a donor who was saying, I, I would give you a million dollars to make some enhancements to baseball. What would a $2 million structure look like? What if others can? And, and we kind of laughed this morning. What did we do? Well, we've come up with a $3 million project. <laughs> So we know we have a million dollars. We have a $3 million idea. That's what master planning is about. Uh, we like to push the envelopes to say what does excellence look like when we're at this stage uh, before anything moves forward. So you can see there's areas, there's hitting bays there. Uh, there's rooms up above, entertainment areas, areas where this board could meet, areas where we could assemble. But most importantly, if you look at that bottom um, piece, that this is a gateway to our university. There may be many people who would come by and, have no intention to go to a baseball game. And they could say, what's East Tennessee State University? I don't know, but that's a first-class facility, much better than the gravel lot. So uh, we don't have the gravel lot anymore, by the way. We paved it this uh, summer, at least part of it. This is another view from inside. Low-hanging fruit, that was our sign. This is our new sign standards. We've developed them. Step in the right direction as you're entering these buildings. This one, if you, if you look on the right-hand side, you know, that, again, it's not the great impression or places students want to gather up at the top, very simple arrangements. On the left, I, this was a book drop. Um, I don't know how many students drive through in a book drop anymore. And so if you look at this piece, I mean, in the background, you have Roman arches, you have greenery, you have trees, you have places to sit, you have a steak and shake. It's just, it's just easy to enhance the student experience in that way. This is also an example of implosion. Um, we were in the old mode of explosion. So we we're going to build a $2 million field house but we had this space, we were storing construction materials, we were able to move a lot of that, some grounds and things underneath the football stadium, and we were able to upgrade an area we already had. This is, again, just low-hanging fruit. Um, this is areas where students can sit. These are new, are new benches. We're gonna have power strips under them installed here shortly so they can charge their devices. You know, graphics, artwork on the wall, 
screens, things of that sort. This is the oldest building on campus, Gilbert Hall. Uh, again, this looked very different before the start of the summer. This is a, a new flooring, has an antique look. There's artwork on the wall. Actually, Dr. Nolan purchased this from our, our artisans, and this is um, a way for an arts and sciences building to showcase what it should be showcasing. A few others, I'll be very brief in the audit committee this morning. I believe a lot of this was talked about by Ben Doherty. But we have a camera project. I will state it shortly. We have Polaroids. They're being upgraded to modern cameras. They have analytics movement. Very important uh, as a security ac uh, access piece. And we'll be able to do that over the course of the next few years with a, with a grant we have from Tennessee. This is an app. This is one component. Um, you can download this now if you want to go to the App Store, uh, ETSU Safe. It will be called something different when it actually functions, so it'll be one university piece. But if you look at some of the options, like if you look at one there called Blue Light, that's one. If you're skateboarding across campus, you break your leg and you need help, you can hit that button and public safety knows where you are. They can come get you. Or if you feel unsafe about something, there's other, you see, resources. If, if it's two in the morning and a student is having negative thoughts or feels isolated, they can hit that and then call a 24-hour helpline. If a tornado came through and we didn't have communications, but you had this phone, you have downloaded PDFs with emergency plans, procedures. So from a safety perspective, this will be a great tool. Up at the top, you see a news feed. At the football game recently, um, we had weather conditions. It can come across uh, what we should do there uh, in the event of those pieces. And a, a great communication device. Much less we can add, where do I find a parking space? How do I enroll in courses? You know, what's open, at, you know, in the food hall this evening. I'd like to thank Andrew Worley. He's here as well. He's taken a great role, a lead role in this. So from a human resources perspective, we talked about this. I'll just briefly say compensation is one of the biggest pieces. We're undergoing a strategic plan for how we deal with this new budget model um, and how we align our efforts uh, there. We'll be undergoing um, uh, scope work here in the next week or two to hire a consultant. I'll end with a few numbers. This is our uh, capital maintenance. So the total figures at the bottom, $73 million. That was $120 million last year. So the numbers changed, but the percentages are very close to the same as they were in prior years. It's a formula based on the amount of square footage. So our 7.6 you know, number is really, really close percentage-wise to where it was last year. But we had a little over $9 million instead of five. What will we do with it? We'll upgrade some HVAC, chiller replacements, ADA compliance. Lastly, I want to leave you with this last slide. And um, again, this is a Frank Lloyd Wright quote. An idea is salvation by imagination. So now's the time for imagination. In any ideas, concepts you have, this is the year. These are the months to bring them forward. But I would like to walk you through um, campus a year from now. So if we start here. We could just start at that place. You, you would come out of Centennial Hall. In that quad, they're playing volleyball. There'll be enhanced activities, games. You walk by a convenience store. You come to uh, the space where that roundabout is. And when you cross the street, that's now that steak and shake. It's a cafe. It's not a book drop. You then go into Borchuk Plaza. What happens there? It could be protests. It could be preachers. Or it could be gaming. Or it could be people just sitting at a, at a fountain. A lot of activities. A very interesting space. When you enter the Culp, so if we come here, this concept was an interior street. When you get there, you will pass delis, bookstores, restaurants. Halfway through, there'll be an area for the Bluegrass Band to have daily concerts or Grayscale. Um, when you get towards the end, Dr. Karen King is absolutely working on a fantastic idea in esports. There will be jumbotrons with maybe the Boston Celtics games if they win the championship. Um, but these machines, they're just lightning fast. Students have scholarships to be involved in this. But this is the activity. Then when you exit, you come out onto that boulevard, and we're talking sculpture, outdoor fitness areas, this type of activity. And yes, as you walk by all of that housing, there'll be swing sets. There'll be activities for people to, to check a text message, talk to a friend. You'll make your way down to Green Stadium where the arch is, and then you'll turn in to go to our Center for Physical Activity, and you'll swim or take a class, or play basketball. That seven or eight minute journey, which was through asphalt and parking lots 10 years ago, this time next year, I bet a student takes an hour and 20 minutes. And it's a very different experience. It's been deliberate. 
and this thought of arcology, this thought of implosion. This is implosion. The Culp Center itself is an existing building. It's being transformed. These spaces are being transformed. Um, it is absolutely the right approach, and many people in the room have pushed for that. And then we need to have that implosion on a lot of these streets. I'll end it there. Dr. Nolan, every Roman Empire had its Caesar, and you've pushed a lot of this vision. If you have anything to add or say, please do. Well, kill me tonight. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're not on that end. <laughs> 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 I was talking more about maybe uh, forums. Any, any questions? I have a question. Yeah. And I'm sure you all have probably done this, but do you have a lot of bike racks? Because we're obviously right off the Treaty Trail. Yeah. And I was wondering if there was any way that the city would extend the Treaty Trail to where we um, tailgate after the games. You know, they can ride their bike to downtown, sure. have dinner, you know, especially day games, and have a very safe way to be able to cross the streets and so forth. Is if we brought our bikes, is there plenty of places for the public, not just the students, to um, have a rack to put their bike? I think it's a good question. We've had uh, broad conversations about bikes scooters, pedestrian ways, even extending the art exhibits with the city. And so a lot of that's taking place now. This boulevard will expand that. But specifically, the one thing you said is, is the biggest concern is crossing the road. If you can cross the road, it, it just links downtown. It, um, I mean, it's a half a mile. I mean, total. It's just, um, I hope so. I, I hope we can conquer some of that. There's absolutely conversations uh, happening right now with the commissioners um, about some options to do that. How that will look, I'm not certain, but they're, they're creating ordinances for some of this. And again, when you get into the West Walnut area, what that looks like, how that's built, those or the ordinance work and the zoning work is taking place now that should provide infrastructure and mechanism to do that. Mr. Chair, if I could follow up on uh, Dr. Latimer's question and Mr. Ross's comments. You know, quite often we look to this board for guidance, direction, and support there's a clear dividing line there. It's called State of Franklin. At a certain point in time, we're going to need this board's support to encourage our partners in Johnson City and Washington County to really look at safety along that corridor. You can pretty easily get up to 45 miles per hour in a quick period of time as you drive adjacent to a campus mm -hmm. that is now pushing students across the street. The students are coming here for classes. We're going to push 1,000 people to the Martin Center for Broadway performances. But there's also Starbucks and everything else that's now here. Um, so this isn't the, the time to bring this to you, but I'm setting a seed. At a certain point, we're going to need your help to drive home the importance to change that artery, and if not change it, to slow it down. Okay. <clears throat> The next item is uh, Center for Rural Health Research Update. Dr. Randy Whitehall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, I'm going to give you a very quick update of um, on the Center for Rural Health Research. And many of you were at the announcement by Governor Lee uh, just about two months ago. Uh, it's really an exciting time. He's recognized the opportunities and the resources that exist here at ETSU and the opportunity to uh, partner with Ballot Health to really address the needs of rural Tennessee. The governor identified 15 distressed counties. And I'm, as you all know, I have to show at least one statistic, so this is the one. Uh, if you compare the early death rate in those 15 counties shown in red with the five richest counties in Tennessee, the early death rate is almost twice as high. And you begin to realize what poverty and rurality does to our health statistics in this state. So we're committed to working together collaboratively with Ballot across the entire ETSU Health uh, to really put together a world-class center for rural health research. Uh, I'm, I'm going to very quickly tell you what we've been doing in the two months since then. Uh, we've, we've put together uh, logistics, outreach, and prioritization. I'm going to touch on each of these very quickly. In terms of logistics, I've put together a team of folks within the college now who can help me set this up while we're hiring full-time folks. So I've put some faculty, uh, parts of people, uh, some willing and, and others very willing um, to, to address, you know, get these things started. Uh, we've also started the process of hiring uh, faculty. We'll have full-time uh, director who will work under me. Uh, four to seven faculty positions and a coordinator. We've had space allocated. We were there this morning with facilities to look at it. 
uh, and um, we've we've really got got started. Most of what I've been spending my time doing in the last uh, bit of time is really reaching out to build partnerships. So I've uh, we've got standing meeting every other Monday with Ballot Health. Um, I'm meeting, have met, or will meet with all of my colleagues at ETSU Health. Have met with. Senator Blackburn's staff, I met with, uh, talked to Senator Alexander's staff. I'll be talking to the Senator next Thursday. I talked to Congressman Rowe this Monday. Uh, but more than that, I've also been reaching out to both national and regional folks and statewide folks who are players in the rural health area. I think I've had 38 meetings or phone calls. And again, everything from the, you know, the CEO of the American Public Health Association down to folks with expertise in early childhood development, uh, child abuse, and all the issues that we need to deal with. The purpose of all of that is to be very systematic and thoughtful to make sure that we set up a center that's going to make a real difference in the lives of the people of this state. That's what we have to do. So my purpose in these outreach and all of these folks is first of all to tell people we're here, that we're, you know, that we're, we're in the game. And if they've ignored us before, they, they shouldn't do it anymore. And then to identify their areas of concern, as my grandfather would say, the first thing you have to do is learn to speak the language. So I need to understand what the educators are saying, what the, um, what the economic development folks are saying. And th that helps us identify the research opportunities and that helps us build connections and networks. And I think we're, we're on to a good start. Uh, obviously, there's only so much we can do on a part-time basis. Once we hire some full-time folks, uh, hopefully this, the next presentation I give to you all will have a lot more a lot more going on. Um, at this, when we started having talked to Ballard, some of you all and the state, we had sort of five areas of priority. The first was to interrupt the intergenerational cycles. I think we, we have a really unique opportunity here because Ballard Health will deliver all the babies born in this region. We have an opportunity to, to impact every single mom with the point of delivery. And the question is, what can we do for those mothers to empower them to launch their babies on the healthiest trajectory possible? So our first choice, our first priority is that. Second, innovative models of healthcare delivery, everything from transportation to telemedicine to alternative uh, providers. Uh, the longitudinal database we've talked about, uh, identifying policies. And then the fifth thing is something that we've come to realize. We talk to a lot of local organizations. Some of them don't have the resources to write their own grants or do evaluation or act as a fiscal agent. If we could do that for them, that will empower these local organizations to expand their reach considerably. Then in talking to everyone else, there's a sixth area that we've added, and that's clearly focusing on the rural elderly. There's no question that this region has a, has a challenge if we don't deal with that. So that's where we are um, today. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. And I do want to say one last thing. Um, I realize, as all of us do, that a center like this, this level of funding doesn't just happen. Many of you were intimately involved with the discussions with the governor, with Ballard, and I, I can't thank you enough because I think it's the exact right thing to do at the right time, and I appreciate all of your help in doing that. So thank you. Yeah. Steve? Virginia? Go ahead. I would like to uh, encourage you to expand your collaboration to include the Clemmer College oh, yeah. because we have a lot of different departments who would fit right into yeah. some of the work that no, you're doing. I've, I've certainly had conversations with Clemmer and okay. I've got a couple of more names I have to reach out to. Okay. Uh, I did talk to uh, Wes Brown at some length because of his expertise and he's given me some names as well, so I'll, I will definitely do that. Thank you. Yes, I have is with, with all the news about Purdue Pharma uh, and the fines that that corporation is going through, when that arrives at the state, is it shared or is it general budget? There's actually been some very interesting conversations that have gone on at the state level about how that money is going to be distributed. I think at, at this point, no one knows exactly how much it is or how it will be distributed. But I suspect it'll be somewhat analogous to the tobacco settlement money, where e each state will have the opportunity to invest it in a way that it sees fit. And I think, you know, Tennessee's done a lot, and this region has done a lot on the opioids in partnership with Ballot Health again. I think we're well positioned to make the case that there needs to be a significant investment in Northeast Tennessee. Other questions? Just a, a follow up to Trustee DiCarlo's comment. Um, that comment is extremely timely. 
And if you look to how states invested their tobacco settlement dollars, those states that made investments in higher education, investments in research, investments in communities continue to realize the benefits of that funding. Uh, the Commonwealth to our north has multiple higher education sites, multiple research entities, multiple economic community development entities that continue to be funded from spinoffs from that trust fund. Other states use those funds to plug some holes, and those funds are now no longer present to benefit the state. So I, I think your comment is really timely, and I'm hopeful that Dr. Wyckoff's work and the influence of many members of this board uh, can ensure that we look long term at the use of those funds at the state level uh, to address long term challenges. I think Virginia did it really, really well with tobacco, and we have a lot to learn from Virginia if those funds are provided to Tennessee in the future. And, and my sense is the attorney generals aren't done with one company. It's going to go much wider. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Next key performance indicators, I ask Dr. Michael Hawk, Chief Planning Officer, to come forward and provide us an update. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and trustees. Uh, earlier this week at senior staff, the president encouraged all of us to have more fun and share more of our personality when we present. He very quickly followed that up with, not you, Mike. <laughs> and I'm going to assume that's because I already do a really good job of showing my personality when we present. What I'm going to talk to you uh, uh, about today is uh, the key performance indicators and what we're going to, my clicker doesn't work anymore. Here we go. And we're also going to talk about the peer group. And the reason that I bring up the peer group is there's some really good questions that you should ask yourself. I think in the research context, we've discovered that when we talk about certain peers, we find out more about what we can and what we can't do quickly. And if you expand that to the institution, most of the time institutions look at a peer group based on who's like us and who do we want to be. And that's fine, and it used to be that that's pretty much all you needed. But I think you would all agree that state policy and other policies in other states have created a situation where you need to be more focused on your competition. And so it helps you define your competitive advantage. Right now, this is our current peer group. And the reason that some of these institutions have an asterisk is because what I did is I went and looked at our Carnegie class, who are those same institutions. What I found is that we have a good balance between aspirational peers and people like us. And that's really good because then the average or the median uh, metric that you use for your benchmarks is something that you can compare to. It's balanced. So now let's talk about the key performance indicators. I want to stress that these are not operational indicators. So Dr. Sherlin earlier today talked about the need for dashboards for enrollment officers. Those are not key performance indicators. Those are operational metrics that allow you to make changes on the fly in the field. These are about outcomes that we look at to determine whether or not we're doing well at making those changes on the fly and in the field. They were developed by a consultant. Um, and when you look at the student experience, we like to look at applications and then enrollment. Um, this is where Dr. Sherlin lives, right? We, we've now merged a lot of these things about the student experience together, which makes it a lot easier to have a simplified set of KPIs. It's a lot different when you're talking about student life and you look at the number of performances or these things. Now the way we measure whether or not we have enough student facing events is if we have enough students enrolled because their commitment to the student experience is what we care about the most. <laughs> Diversity and inclusion, we're going to move beyond this. I think over time uh, and I think um, you're going to see a lot of different moves by the institution around this and it's going to move beyond counting things to more about what it means to be inclusive and what is equity, and how does the institution drive those kind of things, not just here, but in our community. Empowering employees is really about the great colleges to work for and the voluntary turnover rate. Generally speaking, if you have a lot of employees, most of them stay and they're pretty happy, you're doing all right. If a lot of people start to leave and they start to tell you they're not very happy, you probably ought to take a look at it. you also notice if our faculty aren't very happy, a lot of students won't come back either. Excellence in teaching is the graduation rate, faculty size, and the student-to-faculty ratio. You have to be really careful with the student to faculty ratio. There are private institutions that can tell you that they've got a 71 student to faculty ratio. I'm sorry, but I can't charge that kind of tuition. And you've got to really balance what you can deliver with quality and price. And I think that's important. And that's why you'll see in our KPI sheet, I think we've done a good job with that. 
Research and grant activity, um, obviously we're going to make some changes to this as we progress through some of the uh, strategic initiatives that we have in place around um, research and some of the opportunities. Right now we look at the value of proposals submitted, awards received, and the research expenditures, and then the total value of research and sponsored programs. While we can all agree that we should do better at pretty much all the things we would want to do as a university, graduation, research, service, one thing is pretty clear. When it comes to service, it's going to be hard to beat us as far as a regional institution that has the kind of impact we do. Uncompensated care and service hours are through the roof here, and that's because the kind of academic programs and the people that we have are committed to that mission. And that's where we get into regional stewardship, and then we're also going to talk about fundraise and alumni giving. What I presented you is this framework, and I'll show you the, the board in a second. And in the November meeting, we'll give you a packet that has some more detailed information so that you can see that relative to the benchmarks. So one thing that I thought about uh, when we were talking about the presentations and the order of presentations is it always seems like I present right before the president. And I realize it's because I present sad things and he presents happy things. And I don't want you to get that confused with our personalities, because I'm way more positive than he is. <laughs> The, um, the area that's one of our major goals is enrollment. And you can see that we have not made the progress that we want to. But I, a lot of times when people set goals and they see that we don't make the progress that we want to, they think you set the wrong goal. And that's not true. The reason that's the, the primary goal is it's the one that's going to matter a lot. Educational attainment is going to allow people to change their life. I think that Dr. Wyckoff would agree. I know that there's slides that the president puts together. It's the thing that's going to move the needle in Tennessee. And I think Dr. Sherlin referenced that earlier this morning. Research and service and uh, teaching environment are going to be updated. We're setting the files for those. In the stewardship of place, the number of service hours is way up. And when you look at the student success box, there's a red arrow next to that retention rate. And there probably will be at different times as we move. We made a decision several years ago to put in, to put advisors in place differently than we had before, and that moved uh, sustained moved our retention rate up four um, percent. There's some data that you'll see that the president will present. That's a significant number of students every year. Our graduation rate forty nine point seven. That's pretty. I can't tell you how magnificent that is. That's the 2013 cohort and the 2011 cohort. So students that started just two years apart, it was forty one percent. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it's really hard to impact a metric that started four years before you try to have an impact. But we did. But part of the way that we did is we didn't look at graduation rate at the beginning. What we looked at was credit accumulation. Credit accumulation is probably the number one predictor of college success. If you accumulate enough hours, you'll get a degree. And what we've done is that 15 to finish campaign. We're going to take a look at advising and some other areas to see this go up again. But the other thing is, is that we've seen a good increase in the graduation rate in the non-white population. And we've also seen uh, increases uh, relative to um, gender. I think when you look at overall the dashboard, there are areas that need improvement. But I would hope as a board you take into consideration that that's the way you would look at your organizations too. If all you did was look at the things that were going well, I don't think you'd be very happy with your organization 10 years from now. And what we've done is we've sort of bared ourselves to you and said, these are the things we're working on, and we hope you'll let us continue to work on them especially me because I've got two kids and they need to eat. I think somebody referenced that in one of the meetings we had before. The highlights are the retention rate and the graduation rate. The sustained increase in the retention rate is no small feat. And I know in dashboards sometimes year-to-year -year change is really important because it can signal a problem, but we have a sustained change here. The declines in applications, enrollment, and great colleges score are all things that we're going to have to work on. But I would also point out that we made a major organizational shift. We got to the place where we felt like we had the right data to be able to make an assessment about how things were going relative to admissions, and we changed it. When we weren't happy with what was happening, we changed it, and we'll continue to do that. The first step is looking at the numbers and making sure that you're making the right assessments. And as far as the great colleges score, we have had a lot of organizational change. Um, I mentioned the changes in admission, uh, the provost stepped down, um, somebody who had been here a long time. The uh, the other things that were going on around campus, the real thing is that we only dropped two points. And you'll see later in the president's presentation because he gets the nice one. Overall, it's up nine points since 2014 when we started doing this. This is the way we use these KPIs. This is not uncommon from the way that anybody else would use them. The big thing is track progress and identify further improvements. Dr. Clavier talked about quality improvement and the way that our SAC CSE accreditors reviewed our process. 
The big thing there is part of the reason it went better is we started to actually track progress and make improvements. And so I think that that's a big deal. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. President's report and board resolutions. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I don't quite know how to follow that, um, but I, I think I do want to provide some context. Um, I had the chance last week to attend a board retreat for a board for which I'm a member. And individual who has provided historic leadership for that board really stepped forward and talked about how he charged his staff to have fun. And I spent the better part of the next four or five days really reflecting upon where we are as a staff how we engage with you as a board, and how you have an opportunity to see the good side of the institution, the bad side of the institution, everything in between, but also our personalities. So across many of the committee meetings today, you saw individuals present who you've not had a chance to meet before. Ben Doherty presented in the audit committee. He talked about the work that we're doing to address safety concerns that have emerged from our enterprise risk assessment. Our goal is to put the staff who's doing the work in front of you so that you can begin to get a sense of the personalities who comprise the heart of the university. But ultimately, the goal is to have fun. Um, and I think you saw from Mr. Ross's presentation, he loves what he does. Um, I love to make fun of Mr. Ross. Um, I love to make fun of the fact that he enjoys the worst color of all, but he reminds me that when you put blue and gold together, it makes green, so I cut him a little bit of slack. Um, and I think you saw with Dr. Hoff's presentation, we're going to do our best to be open and transparent with you. Um, those numbers that we presented were not altogether the numbers that we'd like. And we're almost not where we want it to be. But what have we done? We saw that coming in January. We made structural changes to the operation. Our retention rates are not quite what, where we want them to be. We shared in the academic committee the comprehensive review of consultants who are looking at the structure of advising services, the structure of financial aid, our back office work. We've had a game plan that has been very, very successful, but we understand that if we're going to hit our KPIs, we've got to adjust that game plan because if not, you're going to get more of the same. But as you do a lot of that heavy lifting, the goal is to get your PowerPoint to work. Um, and have a little bit of fun. I don't know how I did that, but it just happened. Um, so here's the overview. I want to provide some university updates. I want to talk some about teaching research. Can provide a context of a regional update. I'm going to talk some about the challenging, challenges facing both us and the academy as a whole. And then I'm going to close with an assessment of where we are in terms of the university realignment and structural review. So quickly on new faces. You've had a chance today to meet our new chief of staff, Dr. Adam Green. He joins us from the state of West Virginia. Uh, within the state of West Virginia, he, I, I think I got it, um, brings significant grant uh, experience to us a heart for first-generation college students. Our new chief university council joined us uh, in the month of August as well. Uh, Dr. Folks is an alum of the university, a longtime attorney at Baker Donaldson, and prior to that worked in the state in the AG's office. So very excited to have these two individuals in senior leadership positions, but there are others. Earlier in the meeting, you approved tenure for the new dean of our honors college, and we are attempting to bring new faces and new ideas to the campus but those individuals must embody the mission of the university. Both Dr. Green and Dr. Folks embody the mission of the university. So a couple of university-wide updates. Um, you have before you our annual report. It's hot off the presses. This is a reflection of what we as an institution did during the 2018-19 academic year. You can see that 14,574 students were enrolled. Our total operating budget is $437 million. That's all in. That is a significant operation that this board bears the financial responsibility for. You look at the uh, fundraising that we've secured over the course of the past year, and you look at total dollar for the fund balance for the foundation. That was a record year for the ETSU Foundation. But why did we achieve that record year? Because six years ago, we restructured the foundation operations, bringing in embedded advancement officers for every college. 
So this was a reminder for me that we may do something today and you're not going to see the benefits of it for four to five years. The benefits of those embedded advancement officers came through in those numbers. Here's enrollment for the fall. Um, I wish that I had enrollment for other institutions to share, uh, but the Tennessee Higher Education Commission has not released comps. I know that some institutions are up, some institutions are down. As an overall number, uh, our number is down 133. That's within our budgeted confidence intervals, but there are areas across the institution where you see significant growth. Clemmer, 2% increase. College of Nursing, 5% increase. Public Health, 7% increase. I'd like to, in November, bring the College of Nursing to the board so that Dr. Wendy Nearing can share a presentation on what we have done in nursing to really become the preferred provider um, for some programs across the state. Uh, Tennessee Higher Education Commission was here about three weeks ago, and Dr. Nearing and her staff really knocked their socks off with some of the things we're doing to address nursing needs across the state. But that's where we are in enrollment. It's not where we want to be. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll not be in this position next year, and I'm confident that the restructure work that Dr. Sherlin is leading will yield fruit. Student success metrics. As Dr. Hoff referenced, uh, we've got 128 more students per year persisting, and that graduation rate, 280 more degrees per year awarded since, two, since 2017. That graduation rate is start at ETSU, finish at ETSU. When THEC provides their comps on students who started here and finished elsewhere, that number is probably going to be about 58%. Um, that's the highest number in the history of the university in terms of our six-year graduation rate. And I cannot thank the, stuff, the staff enough for their work to make that possible. Some other metrics from the annual report. Um, you see that note there on 48. We talk a lot about student success and academic excellence, and we frame it within the confines of post-secondary education. But I remind the board that under your purview is the university school. You're responsible for educating students grades K through 12 at UH. This past year at UH, 48 students had an ACT of 30 or higher. Two had a 36. Why is that 48 significant? Because the graduating class is only about 82. It is a very small school. It's one of the top 10 high schools in the state of Tennessee. That's a level of academic excellence that sometimes we don't tell the story enough. Rankings. One of the things that you've asked us to do is to share points of pride and excellence. So there you see the university school, ninth best high school in the state of Tennessee. From Mountain City to Memphis, the ninth best high school in the state of Tennessee is on your campus. You see those designations there. All of this is in the annual report. This is not, it'll be in next year's report, but that College of Nursing that I referenced earlier in enrollment growth is ranked number one. Number one best online RSN to BSN program in the state of Tennessee. Number one DNP program in the country here on the campus of East Tennessee State University. And in recent ranking, uh, number four, our psychology department ranked number four in the country for those programs. So it's rare that we have the opportunity to tout that level of academic excellence. And as Dr. Hoff said, he got to give the bad news, I get to give the good news. But let's talk some about budgets. We're moving through a budget cycle in which we're still learning what it is to have a decentralized budget. Um, you will see this year uh, increased fallout revenues that will be divested across each of our campuses. At the, October, at the November board meeting, we'll bring October revised budgets and the colleges will have a sense of how those revenues are distributed. We gave salary enhancements this year for the seventh time in eight years. This year, we increased our base starting hourly pay for entry-level employees, moving it from $8.75 to $9.20, thereby ensuring that no ETSU employee with a family of four is below the poverty line. We did that because it was the right thing to do. I know we had students here earlier in the meeting who uh, expressed with passion their commitment to raising adjunct salaries. We, as the market determined, raise adjunct salaries on a college-by-college -college basis. That's the beauty of the decentralized budget model is for those colleges with gaps, we increase pay. For those colleges where we were already at market, there was no need to provide the enhancements. But ultimately, our goal is to have fewer adjuncts because we want more full-time faculty in the classroom. But I'm just referencing that here with adjunct pay. We made investments, we'll continue to make investments, and we made them because of the stable leadership of Dr. B.J. King and her staff. But then also with the decentralized budget, you will see at the November board meeting some requests from particularized colleges to 
give some performance incentives. That's available to those that are growing. Um, so you will see some flexibility around performance moving forward as a result of the budget. But the key takeaway for the chair and for the chair of the Finance Committee, the budget's balanced. We're going to put money in reserves. We've made investments in our faculty, and I feel pretty good about where we are from a financial perspective. I'd like for our reserves to be a little bit larger, but we'll get there in time. Transition to teaching and research. Within the annual report, you see some of the elements that are spotlighted. Uh, one of the things that I would like to note within this area is that student to faculty ratio of 16 to 1. Uh, that cuts both ways. 16 to 1, a lot of intentional correspondence, communication, and face-to-face -face interactions between our faculty and our staff, but that comes at a cost. So that's a number we have to balance over time um, because if it drops to 15 to 1, unless we're growing enrollment to offset those costs, you're looking at that from the wrong side of the equation. In terms of some other areas, in terms of this interface, $47.5 million in extramural funding. You look at the 198 undergraduate research projects from our Honors College. You look at 162 theses and dissertations that were completed. And then you see the stories of faculty who have transformed the lives of their students. Further stories from this annual report that I would encourage you to pay attention to. So let's talk a little bit about our regional impact. Uh, the chair mentioned in his opening comments uh, the session that was here in the Millennium Center earlier this month where we brought business and industry leaders from across the region together to talk about the state of our region. But what are we at East Tennessee State University doing to embody our mission? Well, 133,000 service hours were provided by student-led organizations, and our student-led organizations raised almost $300,000 for charity. That's our students. Look at the 273,000 patient encounters from our ETSU health facilities. We're the healthcare safety net. If it wasn't for this institution, there would be significant healthcare challenges facing the region, much more significant than already exist. And you can see the volume of activity and engagement across our plays, conferences, performances, debates, etc. You see individualized stories, but I draw your attention to the $2.3 million in uncompensated care. That's care provided by our faculty in ETSU Health throughout our practice network to those who do not have the ability to pay. And then here, as you further drill down into that, I draw your attention to the fact that within the College of Business, we provide free tax consulting and tax support for individuals who need assistance as they're wrapping everything up towards the middle of April. And 2,500 people received naloxone training from our faculty at Gatton. So now let's a little bit of a glimpse of our region. Um, as I shared at the regional summit a couple of weeks ago, um, if I were a physician, you were my patient, and I was giving you the results of your physical exam, I would tell you you're 55 years old, you drink too much, you smoke too much, you're overweight, you don't exercise, if you don't change your lifestyle, you're not going to make it to 60. This is our region. This is the place that we call home. If you compare our rates across smoking, obesity, insurance, poverty, median household income, etc., we're not where we need to be. For almost every key performance indicator, we trail the state but our state trails the region that it calls home. Here you see the lowest educated counties in the south. Look at the cluster in northeast Tennessee. That's the area we call home. Doesn't look that much different than in the Mississippi or in the coal fields of Kentucky. Our population health rankings, we're ranked 42. So not only are we among the poorest performing areas in the state of Tennessee, Tennessee is among the poorest performing states in the union and you're familiar with this statistic. So how does that impact us? Well, we're the only section of the state that's not growing. And we're the only section of the state that has a decreasing labor force participation rate. So what does that mean for ETSU? We're the force that drives prosperity in this region. We're the entity that educates the citizens of the region. And we're not going to be the entity that drives regionalism but I think we are the entity that can provide the data, the statistics, the background to help inform the decisions by key business industry leaders and elected officials as they're trying to figure out the path forward. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges facing ETSU and higher education as a whole. I shared this with you last year, so I put 2008 as the baseline and I had 18. 
Uh, this was just recently released by the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. Um, I'm a board member of ASCU. These are the top 10 challenges facing higher education. Federal policy, economy, budgets, demographic shifts, workforce development, free college, the implementation of federal tax cuts, immigration, sexual, sexual assault, and political polarization. Those are things that I've talked to you about for the past two years. I've shown you Gallup poll data on the changing perceptions of American school higher education. You heard today the work that we've done to update our student conduct policy because of number nine on this list. We're all well aware of what Tennessee Promise has done for the state of Tennessee and to us. Over lunch, we talked about economic and workforce development and the role that it could play for the institution. But let's talk a little bit about demographic shifts. So we shared information with you on the red line on enrollment. We are transforming the way enrollment services exist on this campus so that we can grow enrollment. But we're making those changes now because this is what's on the horizon. Earlier this year, I was asked to present at the Futures Forum on Inside Higher Education about current challenges facing the academy. And during my presentation, I talked about this slide. What this slide is a reflection of is changes in the birth rates in 2007, 8, and 9. So as we went into the Great Recession, people just quit having kids. And that's now moving forward. So what you see in the middle of the next decade is just a drop in the natural progression of 18-year-olds who are going to go on to post-secondary education. You see how that's going to impact community colleges. You see how that's going to impact places such as us. And then you see the impact that will have on the elite colleges and universities. We have to start putting our game plan together now so that in 2025, we as an institution are positioned so that we're not feeling the effects of this. Now, this is national data. I'm happy to, at the next board meeting, if you're interested, break this out for you at a regional level. South's in a little bit better shape than the Northeast, um, but this place that I had the honor to work for for about five years, West Virginia, is already seeing this. We've seen it here because what no longer exists that existed at the beginning of this decade, Virginia Intermont. And for those of you who are on the boards of small private colleges, it's going to be very, very difficult for those small private colleges to weather this in the next seven years. So that's why we're making the changes we're making in enrollment services. That's why we're making the changes we're making in student affairs. And also we're doing it because we can't continue to do this. We can't just continue to raise tuition and fees and raise tuition and fees because we're going to price ourselves out of the market. So I've talked some about university realignment and structural review. Here's the things that we told you at each of the past two board meetings we were going to look at. In the immediate space, we've done number one. We've restructured community service and service learning. In October, we're going to talk about a major service initiative that will bring together the service activities across the campus. We focused on diversity and inclusion, and I'm very pleased to announce today that we are naming Dr. Keith Johnson as the university's chief diversity officer and our VP for access, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Johnson has been a longtime faculty member at the university. He will lead a new unit, the unit that was led by Angela Lewis, that he will build out. And Dr. Johnson, I thank you for the leadership role that you'll play in this space. We've talked about the Millennium Center operations, and we're now in this building, so check that box. And then student success and recruitment, we said we were going to realign, and you already know what we've done there. Near-term opportunities, that's the fall. We said we were going to bring to you thoughts around research and innovation. We spent a lot of time there today. We're going to go back and regroup and make some adjustments and then bring that back to the board so that we can honor the commitment that we made to you to check that one in the fall. Space utilization, we announced earlier this week a position on campus that would manage space at a global level so we can check that near-term opportunity and then compliance risk and human resources. You had a chance earlier today to meet new legal counsel, new compliance counsel, and Mr. Ross referenced the review that's underway in terms of compensation. Long-term is where we'll be focused on our work throughout the fall and into the spring, and that's the opportunity to look at college alignment the potential for college mergers, new college creation or college reorganization. And then Dr. Bishop is leading work to formalize the role of the Office of the Provost and other senior administrative functions. 
with the goal being as we hit the spring board meeting, we can give you an update on the work that we've done there. So now let's look back. Um, quite often as trustees, you come to meetings, you have to listen to boring people like me talk. You go home and you think, what in the world did we do today? And I have that same feeling every day because I have to listen to myself talk and I'm boring. But I have to listen to a lot of the people in this room talk as well. Some of whom, like Dr. Hoff, are a little bit more difficult to maintain than others. But there's a lot of days I go home and think, what in the world did I do today? And life sure was a lot easier when I, all I did was mow grass because I mowed grass to put myself through college. When I finished the day of mowing grass, I could see what I accomplished. So this is our attempt as staff to look back for you to see what you as a board have accomplished over the course of the past couple of years. First, you've approved our tuition, our budgets, and our capital project outlays. Jeremy walked you through today the exciting things that are occurring in capital because of this board and the projects that you've approved and the vision that you outlined. There are faculty all across our campus who had salary enhancements because of the actions that you took and most importantly, the action that you took in your strategic plan to say people come first, and if there are new dollars available, they go to salary first. There are faculty all across this campus who had the joy of receiving promotion and tenure three today because of the actions of this board. We've launched new programs, or we hope to launch new programs in occupational therapy and digital media. You've approved. We're now waiting on THEC to tell us we could do what we wanted to do a year ago if we were a private school. We've recognized the service of our board and staff, Kiana Miller, Fred Alsop, Ed Kelly, Jane Jones, and Burt Bach. One of the most important things that a board and anyone can do is to celebrate accomplishment, and we've celebrated the accomplishments of individuals who are legends at this institution. We've sat through a plethora of presentations on veterans affairs and student life and housing and residence life and key performance indicators. But why were those presentations important? because that's the way through which you hold us accountable and your feedback goes back and enforces staff action. You provided accountability around research strategy and execution, and we're gonna to continue to try to meet your expectations in that space. We wouldn't have the risk management protocols that were in place if it were not for this board. We've spent more time talking about risk and audit and enterprise risk assessment in the past two years than I bet we have in 107 years at ETSU. Who drove that? This board. We've appointed new deans and honors the library and graduate studies because you pushed us to bring new ideas, new perspectives to this institution. And then finally, you've invested countless hours in advocacy in support of this university. You've had us to your home. You've brought individuals to this institution that we would not have been exposed to. You've made contributions to this institution that will transform the lives of students for generations to come. And you've been present I cannot drive home the importance enough of your presence. When you come up into the university box at a football game to say hello, people notice that. When you come to events, when you come to plays, when you're on campus, when you take time to speak to student convocations or faculty convocations, that is noticeable by the campus, and I thank you for being present. Finally, and I'll close here, um, it's our goal as a board and as a staff over the course of this year to have some fun. We want you to push us, but we also want you to enjoy your time on the board. So we're gonna look to change some of the board meetings up. Um, there was a call today in the academic affairs meeting to maybe look at some joint scheduling of other boards, a chance for us to learn about them and for them to learn about us. Um, there's an open invitation for every single football and basketball game I'm a little better behaved at football than I am at basketball, so you may want to not sit next to me at basketball. Chairman Neiswanger has to put up with me. But we play Austin P tomorrow. Many local elected officials will be in the university's box. Um, and on a day when it rains like it did last Saturday, gosh, I hope we're done before 1.30 in the morning, we'd love to have you join us. It's an honor to serve this board. It's an honor to serve this campus. And it'd be my honor to take any questions that you have about these or other topics. Questions at all? Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Chair, the next item to come before uh, the board is a resolution of appreciation from Mr. James Powell. Mr. Powell is unable to be with us today. You see the resolution as provided in the board materials. 
Um, I would like to draw your attention to an email that I sent you about two weeks ago uh, that referenced uh, an investment that Mr. Powell is making in the future of this institution. I would just encourage you to go back and pull that email up and to look at what Mr. Powell has done and the impact that that can have on the institution. Uh, Mr. Powell is a humble person. He does not like anyone to draw attention to him. Um, a number of years ago, I said, Mr. Powell, I'd like to put your name on something so that folks know what you do. And he said, Brian, people know what I do. What he's done is provided scholarships for more than 9,000 students to attend East Tennessee State University. And on behalf of staff, it's my pleasure to present this resolution for your consideration. Do I have a motion for adoption? But moved. And a second. 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 All in favor, please aye. say aye. Aye. Opposed? Yes, sir. And we'll get this to Mr. Powell and would love to have a board member to join me when we travel to his home in Limestone for this presentation. Um, <clears throat> the next, Mr. Chair, is a letter of resolution of appreciation for Dr. David Linville, who is going to kill me because Dr. Linville is not a fan of this. No. He wasn't a fan of it when we did it for others, and he's not a fan when we do it for him. But I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege to thank Dr. Linville. You're still officially kind of secretary to the board, so you can at least hold your resolution. <laughs> Dr. Linville's background is in the health sciences. Dr. Linville's a graduate of the Quillen College of Medicine, but he's also a graduate of the Clemmer College. When we were creating the board, and as we were looking to build a board from scratch, that's write every policy, that's develop a structure for agenda items, that's craft the bylaws. As I looked across the campus, and I'll never forget saying to Dr. Bishop, we need the most talented person on this campus to help us get this done. And she goes, well, that's David Linville. Dr. Linville has done an outstanding job shepherding the board through its first two and a half years of existence. I know he's excited to transition this off to Dr. Green so he can move back to his academic pursuits. Mr. Chair, the resolution is in front of you, but I just want to say thank you to Dr. Linville for his leadership and would offer this resolution for your consideration. Okay. Do I have a motion? A motion. And a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Just, just briefly, um, thank you, Dr. Nolan, and thank you to the trustees. Um, you know, what is it in standing up a board? Um, it, it really is an amazing thing that we have here at this university. And my son, who was, I guess, 11 at the time when we started, um, asked my wife, what, what is it that, what's this board thing? And so she pulled up a recording of, of one of our first meetings and uh, showed him a little bit of what you all do. And I think he was enamored at, at what a board does. Um, at which point he turned to my wife and said, you know, I used to think dad had an important role at the university, but all he does is call the roll. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot more to it, as you know, and, and I thank you for this opportunity to have served the university in this, in this way. Um, there are many more people that make it function. Um, you as trustees, there's an entire staff that makes stays like this possible. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that two-year slide that Dr. Nolan showed you. And um, it's an amazing chapter that we're in here at the university. I'm excited to get back to ETSU Health and to see what we do there and to help write the next chapters of the university with you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Next, we have selection of board chair and vice chair and standing committee membership. Chair, yep. Sorry. Um, Chairman Neiswanger, members of the Board of Trustees, um, as required in the Focus Act and the bylaws of the board, the board every two years must appoint a chair and vice chair for the board. Um, it's hard to fathom that we have already moved through the first two years of service and it has come time to appoint individuals to serve in the capacity of chair and vice chair, as well as to stand up formally the committees for which you served this morning. Um, I've spoken with a number of members of the trustees and I've spoken with the chair of the board and the vice chair of the board. Uh, this is still in a very early time in the history of the institution. 
There's a lot of work in front of this board and on behalf of staff, staff would make the recommendation that Chairman Neiswanger be appointed to another two-year term as chair and that David Golden be appointed to another two-year term as chair and that the faculty and that the composition of the committees that members sat in this morning would continue as comprised during this morning's committee meetings. So you, there would be the need for a motion for Chairman Neiswanger to serve another two-year term as chair, Vice Chair Golden to serve another two-year term as vice chair, and for the committees to be comprised as they were this morning for the committee deliberations and activities. Do I have such a motion? I'll move. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to make the <laughs> Kelly make a motion. Please. Okay. <laughs> So we have a, we have, and this is awkward because at this point in time, you're not the chair. So it's like our very oh. first meeting all over again. <laughs> so we have a motion from Trustee Wolf and a second from Trustee Ramsey. Any comment? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll give you back your meeting. As <laughs> long. I knocked down a coup. There was a coup that was on. I knocked down a Glad you straightened that. That is. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. So, I've already done it. Okay. Done. Awesome. We did it. 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 Yes, sir. Got it. Okay. So, uh, we're down to other business. Any other business to come before the board today? If none, I would ask uh, Governor Ramsey. I move. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think this was a first. We wrapped up 15 minutes ahead of schedule. We'll try to do better next time. <laughs>